The M10 is a tank destroyer, not a tank. And that, that does make a considerable difference. But the whole idea of the tank destroyer ends at about the end of the Second World War. They'd gone out of fashion completely. They were a feature of the American army during the Second World War, that was all. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. This is an M10. It's actually a tank destroyer rather than a tank. And I thought perhaps I ought to start off by explaining quickly what a tank destroyer is all about. Because they're, they're, it's a term that's gone out of fashion completely now. But at the time, in the early part of the Second World War, before the Americans were actually involved, they sort of came up with the idea that the tank was for, fire, for supporting infantry and dealing with infantry matters, and it wasn't supposed to fight another tank, which is fine if you can make sure the enemy are playing with the same rules, and they're not usually, but still, there we are. So they founded a tank destroyer organization down in Texas. And the first vehicles they had were things like the little um, the M6, which was a, um, a Dodge 300 weight with a 37 millimeter gun on the back. It's described by an American author as um, completely ridiculous. So um, in his words, anyway, he was uh, against using it and uh, the idea was rather like the um, another Amer later American tank destroyers was that they were working on the shoot and scoot basis in other words you loosed off around and then cleared off the trouble was that there were lots of German tanks around who could easily destroy a, a thing like an American truck and didn't bother to waste time waiting for them to find a defensive position, they wiped them out. Um, the, so that thing disappeared very quickly. It was replaced by what looked to be a promising anti-tank vehicle. It mounted a three-inch gun firing over the bonnet, but the basic vehicle was a, an American half-track, and that became their tank destroyer for the early part of the fighting in Tunisia. They were actually described by an, um, the American soldiers as purple heart boxes. And you can work out pretty quickly what great advantage that was. It was a jolly good way of getting killed. So they, um, they decided not to have those anymore and they gave them away. I think the British had them and used them for other purposes, which they found very effective. But that's neither here nor there. The M10 which is really a Sherman tank underneath, was the next vehicle to be evolved. Now, the actual tank destroyer people didn't like it. They said it was too slow and not manoeuvrable enough. They wanted something that could get in fast, fire and get out again. Again, the shoot and scoot principle. But um, this thing was really too difficult. Now, the M10 is basically an M4A2 Sherman. That's the version of the Sherman fitted with twin diesels. And in, in that, it's rather unusual because it means that the US Army, which used the M10 as well as the British Army, were using a vehicle powered by a diesel, di twin diesel engines. Now, that didn't matter. The actual engines were perfectly serviceable and the M4A2 ran very well. But the Americans had come up with the scheme of basing all their vehicles on one sort of fuel, which was petrol. And they didn't really like to have the two kinds of fuel, petrol and diesel, flowing about at the same time. It made for confusion. So that was one reason why the M4A2 wasn't all that popular. But they were used quite a lot. There was later on, actually, um, an M10A1, which was based on the M4A3, which had the Ford V8 engine in it. But that wasn't used operationally. The M10 was. They were used by the um, most armies, in fact, the American, the British, the French, and so on, all the way through from about 1942 onwards. And they were quite unusual. They've got a 
as you can see, a sloped side and front to them. They have a front slope front anyway. But they have a slope side, armour thickness about 37 millimetres, which is a little bit less than the front of a Sherman, which is about 50 mil. And, um, but basically, it's a Sherman tank. It's a little bit faster, it'll do 30 miles an hour, where a Sherman would normally do about 25, 29. But um, apart from that, it's more or less the same. It is really a tank in everything but finish. The Tank Museum is a registered charity and every purchase you make from our online shop directly supports our work. We ship worldwide and if you subscribe to our email list, we'll give you 10% off your next order. When you finish this video, go to tankmuseumshop.org and you'll find something you never knew you needed. Being a tank destroyer, it didn't have a coaxial machine gun and it had an open top turret. I think that was probably partly due to the fact that they reckoned that it would be manned by their artillery people who liked to work in the open air, or so they said. But anyway, that's the, the reason, one of the reasons why they didn't have an open, or they had an open top turret on this vehicle. But you can see how the design is. Armour thickness, a little bit less than the um, Sherman. The tank destroyer people wanted even less armour on it, but there's a limit. And really, it's quite a useful fighting vehicle. The three inch gun, which they originally had, I think it was the M6 gun, was um, actually quite effective. Much better than anything they had mounted in a tank anyway. But the British opted for putting the 17 pounder into some, and this is an example of one which has been modified to take the 17 pounder. Now when the vehicle was built, when the M10 was built, they were built with a view to mounting three different types of weapon. The 105 millimeter howitzer, the three inch anti-tank gun and the British 17 pounder. But because the Americans weren't interested, they only built them with the three inch anti-tank gun in. And the British modified them to take the 17 pounder. It was quite a simple task because it a lot less confusing than making the Sherman Firefly. But it did mean having a, a new um, sleeve around the barrel when it passed through the mantlet just to, because the three inch was much bigger but otherwise more or less the same but the 17 pounder was much more effective even than the three inch it meant that they had a, a vehicle here they were used in british service by the royal artillery and you had a vehicle that could take out a panther and even a tiger with reasonable chance of success they were very very effective but of course somewhat vulnerable with the open top turret on them but that's the sort of vehicle that it is it's powered as i say by the twin diesels it's um, otherwise a sherman as you can see with the same suspension and everything else but it is a tank destroyer rather than a tank at the very end of the war they came up with a, an armored cover for the turret but i don't think it was ever used operationally it was really something that came too late for, um, you know, to keep the vehicle going. But they were quite effective. They lasted in the British Army after the war. They were taken into service by the Royal Armoured Corps and used as anti-tank vehicles even then, for a few years after the Second World War. And then they were scrapped. And then the other countries were given them, a lot were given away to um, France and Belgium and that thing. This particular um, exhibit came from Belgium. It looks quite good, but it, actually it's rather tatty inside. It could do with some cleaning up. But outside it looks very good indeed and works quite well. But it's, it's quite a nice vehicle to have in the collection. Quite an unusual one. A lot of them ended up, well, because they weren't used operationally by anybody else, in Israel where they were used because they were grabbing anything that would go at the time, but otherwise you don't see them very often now. And the whole idea of a tank destroyer, as distinct from a tank, died at the end of the war. They realised, I think, that the tank would have to fight a German tank if it met one. It couldn't wait around for one of these things to come up and sort out the problem. It had to deal with the problem as it found it. 
And that is one of the reasons why the tank destroyer just vanished completely. And that's the end of the, of the whole tank destroyer story in 1945.